My parents were like um, very keen horticulturalists or like gardeners, even though they were pharmacists. And, um, you know, when I finished up, I was like 18. It was like, what do you want to do? Kind of thought landscaping horticulture. So um, I did a degree in landscape management. And then it was the time of the recession and um, I was trying to get a job and there wasn't any work apart from basically working for the local, um, you know, tree company. So that's how I started and uh, really enjoyed it, wanted to do more learning. So did some professional courses like the um, Arboricultural Association Tech Cert, went to Merris Wood, did the 10 week tree surgery and just kept on from there and, you know, went to London, then New York and now, you know, I'm in Santa Monica in California. So just always like trees, they've been good to me. Um, being outside, but also, you know, having um, an influence and an impact on the, the environment that people live in. So, yeah, that's why I enjoy the subject. You know, trees help bring the countryside or bring the natural world somewhat into the city. They, you know, I think as, as human beings, we've created towns, we've created cities. Um, are they the most healthy places for us to be? Perhaps not. Um, but at least trees help us mitigate some of those negative impacts. Um, and I think they, you know, they do more for us than perhaps we still appreciate. You know, we, I think more and more research is coming out about um, environmental benefits, about the social um, advantages of having a well-treed city. Um, so I think that they, they, they play an increasingly important role and they also link us to the past. They're a, a living thing that represents time. And um, I've, I've always enjoyed um, being able to sort of see or touch or feel trees that have also been um, significant to people in the past. So I think it, they're just a, a, a great living statement of where we've been um, and also when we plant trees and we invest time and effort into that, we're also in many ways we're doing our bit to pass that forward to future generations as well. Um, I don't think we know how to react because I don't think we've fully quantified the potential impact. Um, I'm lucky, I've worked in New York where I've seen what could potentially happen, for example, with Asian longhorn beetle if we didn't do something about it. Um, I've also seen in, in California um, diseases like xylella, which we're talking about here now, um, fusarium on our Canary Island date palms. And um, I think they have an amazing ability to decimate tree populations if we're not appropriate, we don't have strong leadership um, and we don't take it seriously. Um, I think we, like many things environmental, I think we all have to kind of pitch in and do our bit because if we don't, if we're relying on other people to do things for us, um, then they, they do have a, a much greater potential to um, significantly negatively impact the resource that we manage, ultimately trees. So I don't think we're overreacting, but I think that um, we need to be careful not to just de be sort of like um, scaremongering. We need to be putting forward proactive, um, intelligent ways to mitigate their possible negative impacts. And I think we need you know, strong leadership, we need partnership, um, we need to take them seriously, um, but, we, but we need to be, um, I think, realistic in what we can do. But I think small steps can make a great deal of positive impact, but we just need to make those steps. We need to be clear on who's making them as well. And we all need to, um, like I think we heard at this conference, be prepared to take some responsibility for doing our bit to mitigate the potential for um, pests and diseases breaking out in our communities. Um, I think you need data, you need to know what resource you're managing, you need to know your species composition, you need to know where your trees are, you need to know where you could have trees, you need to be able to back up what you're saying um, continually with data and metrics. And I certainly learned that from working in New York in a Bloomberg administration. Um, because the more numbers you can regurgitate, the more you understand what potential you could have for greater levels of urban forest resource, um, the more you can also communicate what could be at risk. Like from example, Asian longhorn beetle, we knew that if we did nothing at all, 47% of New York City's tree population were potentially at risk. And then you can put a dollar value on um, how much all those trees are worth and then you can really make people sit up and think a little bit more about it and then we can look at well what's the cost to try and control this or try and protect these 47% of our urban forest and then you can look at those things 
against each other and you can say from a sort of like a cost benefit analysis point of view, is it worth us doing something or isn't it? And obviously in New York, it was seen that it was. And then we did you know, a partnership approach between New York City Parks Department, New York State and the US Forest Service working through the um, US Department of Agriculture. And there was a, a, you know, a really impressive proactive approach to controlling that um, potential um, pest and disease or, or one that was already impacting the urban forest, but to limit it and to mitigate it. Um, Manhattan, for example, in New York has recently been deregulated from Asian longhorn beetle concerns, but still areas of Brooklyn and Queens are still regulated, they're still quarantined, and you still um, control moving um, host wood in and out of that quarantine zone. I think more now I'm in California, what I've learned about is community involvement. Um, and really engaging your community, letting them know what you're doing, why you're doing it, um, because ultimately they're the people that can speak to their council members, um, speak to you, even your higher ups, or whatever, and influence policy, influence resources, and make sure that um, the people that are um, maybe in the in the political framework understand that the community actually holds trees as being very important, and trees can't be sidelined in development in changes to infrastructure and so forth that they have to be thought about. Um, and, and, and then that is kind of, you know, the community works on that. And then as you move forward, you can see the greater benefits coming through and, and so forth. So I, I think that we've heard at this conference a lot of talk about involving the community more. Um, it's not easy to do. It's something that as an urban forester, I've had to really learn that because I'm very much operations side. But the more I've engaged with the community, the more I've told them what, what's going on and what we could do and what's, what our problems are, but what, what, what our achievements are as well, um, the, the really the easier it is for me to do my urban forestry because I have their support. And if you have their support, because ultimately the trees that I manage are their trees, they're not my trees, they're not the council's trees, they're the trees of the community. Um, so I think that that's been one of my biggest successes. But you, you need the data, you need the metrics really to properly communicate with the public and with decision makers and politicians and so forth. Um, that's always, I think, a cornerstone of a good proactive urban forestry program. What I've tried to do, I, I can't obviously speak for others, um, but certainly where my successes have been is to really, again, it was with the data, with the metrics, um, to look at what we need to do in terms of, say, species diversity, age diversity, um, where we have opportunities for trees, thinking about new species, thinking about how we select trees and where we plant them, thinking about planting spaces, soil volumes, available moisture and so forth, um, and really dialing in our programs. So, you know, what I, I think what I've seen in the industry, and this is just my opinion, is I, I sometimes see a lot of like rhetoric, I call it sort of rhetoric about, oh, we're gonna be sustainable, we're gonna be diverse, have a, a diverse species palette and so forth. Um, and I think that's great. But what we need to do is we need to deliver on those promises. Um, and we can only do that with data and metrics. So we need to not just talk about diversity. We actually need to show that we're moving towards diversity. The way I've done it is I've selected species at a planting um, place level. So I know how many places I've got for trees. And I know what species I'm going to plant in each and every one. So I can project forward in, say, 50, 60 years time that this will be my species palette and there will be nothing over 5%, no genus over 10%. But I can't do that unless I've made those decisions. So again, I, I think that we need to think about what we're trying to achieve and then we actually need to have a proactive plan to get there. Um, I also, in Santa Monica, I have like annual metrics, five-year metrics and 10-year metrics the whole time, really providing um, sort of feedback, situational awareness on the the condition and the function of the urban forest. And then you can look at those metrics, you can look at where we're trying to get to, and you'll see, hopefully, if you've got it right, the urban forest moving to where you want to be. So you can see your species diversity increasing. You can see your age diversity increasing. Um, and anything else like with sustainability or like environmental services delivery, you can see that going up if you've got it right. And if you haven't got it right, or things are not going that way because you don't have enough resources or um, things aren't happening the way you thought they would, that's okay. And you can communicate that to your politicians, to your, to your bosses, to your community. And then maybe you've got time then to make adjustments so you can get back on track. And again, moving towards having what, you know, I'm trying to provide a sustainable urban forest resource to the community of Santa Monica. And, and you know, I need to provide them feedback. I, I meet with the community every two months. And then every year I report on my metrics. So hopefully we can see as a group 
Are we going the right way? Are we going the wrong way? And if we are going the wrong way, what can we do to get us going back on the right way? You know, we, we're looking at to architecture, we're looking to urban design. Um, I think we are seeing trees being used more and more um, in the urban, urban world, but we are urbanizing. Um, the question is, or the, or the message to me, is making sure that we don't leave trees out of that equation. And I still think we are a little bit. Um, so I think we need to make sure that, you know, opportunities like iTree, um, some of the social science stuff, that really trees are not like an add-on. They're not something that we just throw in at the end. Um, it's not just about aesthetic beauty. But like I saw, say, in New York with um, Mayor Bloomberg, with um, Plan NYC, with sustainability plans for the city, is actually using them as proper tools of sustainability in an urban world, building them into those bigger um, plans um, for, city, for city design or, or for future urbanization. Um, because they are tools, they are ways that we can green the urban world. Um, they're very cheap tools compared to many of the other technologies we see um, for providing a living um, world. And I think that um, in Santa Monica, we're looking more and more at this sort of idea of social well-being and this well-being indexes. And you continually see parks and recreation, and trees are always a big part of that. So I think that hopefully people are smart enough to realize that it's trees, sometimes, yeah, they drop leaves and berries and they block out the sun or, or so forth. But ultimately, they're helping us live a more productive, longer, hopefully, lives. And therefore, they're really necessary. And even though sometimes they have some negative elements to them, that's worth putting up with because of the good things that they provide to us.